Good afternoon. My name is David Canton, and I'm the Interim Dean of Institutional Equity and Inclusion at, and Associate Professor of History at Connecticut College. And I'd like to thank the TEDx staff and team for bringing me out here so I can spend the next 18 minutes sharing a couple of words, or some thoughts and some ideas on white privilege, poverty, and drug addiction in American society. So the title of my talk is White Privilege, question mark, Poverty and Addiction in America. And when we talk about white privilege, there's a photo of Peggy McIntosh, sociologist who wrote an essay in 1988 called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. And what she found is that, think of white privilege as a knapsack, and in the knapsack there's 50 quote unquote benefits. One, for example, I can be late to a meeting without having the lateness reflect on my race. And we find that most of those benefits, many are psychological, right? That they don't have a material benefit, but there's a psychological benefit. Will make your day less stressful. Now we also look at privileges another way. I'm six foot seven. Many times people say, wow, I love your height. But when I get on a plane, I'm on the exit row seat, I'm jammed in the middle, you don't want to be my height. When I get on a train in New York City subway, I have to duck every five minutes so I don't bump my head. So privilege is not static, changes context. But we look at white privilege, can we see some similar things? Particularly when we look at poverty and addiction or drug addiction. Sometimes the privilege can be a hindrance. Sometimes the privilege can create a false sense of security that doesn't allow society to address the structural problems or the causes of the issue. So when we talk about psychological wage of whiteness, or, or the psychological wage of whiteness, we're talking about W.E.B. Du Bois in 1935 in his book, Black Reconstruction. And he's looking at white working class men. And I'll read the quote. It must be remembered that the white group of laborers, while they received the low wage, were compensated in part by a sort of public and psychological wage. They were given public deference in titles of courtesy because they were white. Their vote selected public officials, and while this had a small effect on the economic situation, it had great effect upon their personal treatment and the deference shown them. Small effect on their economic situation, right? So when we think of white privilege, it's not just material, it's also psychological and does not really oftentimes mean some benefit economically, right? So when we particularly look at poor whites in terms of poverty and drug addiction, yes, there's white privilege, but sometimes that can be a hindrance to solving the root of the problem. Here we have a photo of Martin Luther King, Jr., civil rights leader, Morehouse College graduate, as am I. In his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos of Community, published in 1967. Here's a quote. Of the good things in life, African Americans have approximately one half those of whites. Of the bad, he has twice those of whites. When we turn to the negative experience of life, the Negro has a double share. And he's correct. If you look at infant mortality rates and unemployment rates, the black rate is twice the white rate. But what happens when we look at the numbers? We see here United States by the numbers. Total US population, approximately 2015, 322 million. White, 63%, blacks, 14%, Latino, 17%, Asian, 6%. So it's good to keep those numbers in mind. So if we know whites are a majority, right? Since whites are the majority in the United States, they will be the majority in using Dr. King's words in good things and negative experiences. So if this is the case, when we discuss poverty and drug addiction, there's perception that poverty is black and how the nation treats black and white drug addicts. So if whites are the majority, we know more whites use and purchase illicit drugs, but a sentence is a much lower rate. If we know whites are the majority, there are more whites who are poor than African Americans. Poverty. So here we have two homes, four one is foreclosed, so I didn't pick a trailer park, 
and I didn't pick public housing, I didn't put a face to it, we just call it poverty. As of today, there are 19 million white poor Americans, 8 million poor blacks. That means there is twice the number of poor whites than blacks. Let me say that one more time. There are twice the number of poor whites than blacks. So we go back to Dr. King's quote in these negative experiences. So in terms of the number, twice the number of whites are poor than blacks. So if there are more white poor people, when we think of welfare, why do we think of this black woman? Thanks to Ronald Reagan. We associate black women with welfare. If whites are the majority of poor, there are more white women on welfare, there are more whites receiving benefits, SNAP, food stamps, and all these other uh, things associated with poverty. But this is how it works. The white poverty rate is 10%. We said whites are 64%. The black poverty rate is 28%, but blacks are 13% of the population. And this is where we have the confusion. Well, why is the black poverty rate twice the white poverty rate? And that's how we start playing these semantic games, right? So I'm thinking if I'm white and poor, my privilege is, well, at least the white poverty rate is less than the black poverty rate, but how does that help a white person on welfare? The question should be poverty. 19 million poor whites, 8 million poor blacks, that's 27 million poor Americans. And we're gonna find that what leads to poverty, bad education, poor schools, low wage jobs. So this white privilege of being poor, is that a privilege? It, does it provide a psychological benefit? Well, at least I'm not black and poor. Yeah, but you're still white and poor. You still have no job. You're still getting evicted from your home. We have to change the discourse when we look at poverty in these numbers. Drug addiction. On the left, crack cocaine, a cheap form of cocaine that formed the basis of Ronald Reagan's war on drugs and the foundation of the prison industrial complex, which really was a war on black and Latino communities and black and Latino drug addicts. Crack is cocaine, but not according to drug, sentences law, drug sentencing laws. People who possess crack receive five-year mandatory minimums for possession distribution. In fact, in 1970, there were 300,000 prisoners. Now, in 2016, 2.4 million in prison, and the majority are nonviolent offenders, and many were drug addicts. Prior to the enactment of the Fair Sentencing Act, it took 100 times as much powder cocaine as crack cocaine to receive the same 5 to 10 or 20 year mandatory minimum prison term. So, I know many of you out there saw the movie Scarface. We had a boatload of cocaine. Sniffed it up at the end, it would take in that much maybe to get two years mandatory minimum. Crack is the same as cocaine, but the sentencing was disproportionately on black and Latino communities. Then we also had to popularize through movies, gangster rap, CNN, 24-hour news, New Jack City. So this person, these dealers became a menace to society, and the government acted quickly to rule these, get these individuals out of the community. Okay? On the right, we have heroin, a cheap opiate, painkillers, right? And then fentanyl is a synthetic cutting agent that makes the heroin more deadly. We know names painkillers such as oxycodone, oxycotton, oxy-80, vikes, hydros, pikes, percocet. New England is referred to as the cradle of the heroin epidemic. New England is 78% white. Middlesex, Massachusetts, a town outside of Cambridge, between 2000 and 2014, 1,634 overdose deaths. Many are overdosing in McDonald's, hospitals, libraries, train stations. Just the other day in the New Haven Register, front page article about local law enforcement and federal law enforcement agents getting together to wipe out these opioid, opioid distributors. When we look at the heroin epidemic, when we think of the American popular imagination, where are the movies? Who are these dealers? Where do they live? What type of cars do they drive? So we know about the users, but who's selling? Who's profiting? Are they in videos? Do they make money? We have no idea. So we're thinking about the users, which we should, but what about the ones selling? How do we make them 
like the enemies of the state we did in the 80s and 90s with crack cocaine dealers. Treatment. We have uh, next Lazone, okay? In February 2016, President Barack Obama proposed $1.8 billion in the 2017 budget to address the heroin epidemic. Proposals include evidence-based prevention programs, prescription drug monitoring, prescription drug take-back events. Also, states will receive $12 million to use funds to purchase Nexlazone for first responders. So this is used if you're suffering an overdose, you get it and then you stop the overdose, keep you from dying. So you are not treating heroin addicts as criminals, we're treating them as addicts. White privilege, because they're white, that's the privilege, okay? However, what's the downside? By not checking your privilege, we're not getting at the root causes of the, of the addiction, which I'll get to in a minute. Crack epidemic, black and Latinos receive punishment. We have a picture of the Corrections Corporation of America, founded in 1983 in Nashville, Tennessee. Listed on the New York Stock Exchange, CXW, at $31 a share as of yesterday. Made famous by Kanye West's song, New Slaves. It, raked, it made $1.7 billion in revenue, right, a private uh, prison company. Recently in the news, former President Bill Clinton's 1994 crime bill has received a great deal of attention. And we saw it on TV uh, last week. But part of that bill was, yes, they were going to arrest these violent people who sold drugs, but, the, but black legislators asked for $2 billion for treatment, $3 billion for intervention. What happened? Those did not pass. What passed was creation of new prisons and 100,000 new police officers. Black legislators asked for better policing. They said, take 100,000 more police officers. Doesn't that sound familiar? Mike Brown, Sandra Bland. It's not about adding more police, it's about improving police procedures. Here we have a canary in a coal mine. Now in a recent New York Times article, it stated that white middle-aged men mortality rates have increased. Suicide, drug overdose, listed as accidental poisonings. So we have white males between the age of 25 and 44 whose mortality rates are decreasing. This picture, The Canary, there's a book by Lonnie Guinea and Gerald Torres called The Miner's Canary. Now I'll read the quote. Like the canary's distress, which alerted miners to poison in the air, issues of race point to conditions in American society that endanger us all. So back to these white working class men. The reason for the, de increase, in, the decrease in the mortality rates is what? There's no clear answer but they believe because these white males are isolated, left out of the economy and society who have gotten ready access to cheap heroin and to prescription narcotic drugs. Go figure, no jobs, marginalized on the economy, right? African Americans have been suffering that past and present for the last 100, 200 years. So now it's catching up to suburban whites, which is the, suburban whites which is the fastest growing population of poor people. White privilege, yes, treatment. Treated as an addict, not as criminal. But at the same time, not getting at the core. The core of the problem is what? An economy that's shrinking, money rising to the top, and now white working class or white suburban people are feeling that, and that privilege, whether it's protecting them, but not really getting to the cause of why there's increasing of suicides and drug overdose. So that's when we can see white privilege, that's not even a question mark, can also be a problematic. Going back to my height, it's great to be 6'7". When that middle seat on that airplane, it's terrible. When you want to go to the mall, buy a pair of size 16 shoes, impossible. So same for these white working class men. If they do not, so if they do not see that their future is connected to the African American past and present, we'll have the same lecture again in another 50 years. Thank you very much.